In the past five years, the three university research corridor institutions, Michigan State University, the University of Michigan, and Wayne State University, conducted $1.64 billion in infrastructure-related research and programs in the fields of water, mobility, energy, and communications. To highlight challenge areas and build new connections, the URC launched the Infrastructure Innovation Tour across Michigan. Five stops, five issues. With the help of researchers, legislators, and local government and business leaders, each stop explored regional needs, emerging research, and set the stage for future collaboration. In Monroe, algal blooms and microplastics threaten water quality, while new lead and copper rules challenge municipal water systems to find innovative, cost-effective solutions. Rural communities like Sanilac County struggle to access broadband internet. Creative partners may help bridge the digital gap there and elsewhere. Sterling Heights attendees shared new ways to repair and rebuild roads, from funding partnerships and new materials to sensor technology and monetizing roadway data. What I liked about today was you're also adding the um, um, higher ed component and the research component into the conversation, which also I think has been really neglected over time. PFOS contamination threatens Michigan's drinking water. In Kalamazoo, cleanup discussions focused on data partnerships, groundwater models, and filter technology to capture and destroy these contaminants. There was a lot of brain power in here, and I think the more knowledge and the more collaboration of knowledge, the better we're all going to be and the better served our public will be. In Sault Ste. Marie, we unpacked the economic and environmental impacts of maritime shipping and how balancing competing interests in our interconnected system can yield better solutions and greater opportunities. I'm very appreciative of what URC has done for us here in the community and uh, what they're trying to do. And getting us all together is, uh, is an important aspect in that. And um, we will look forward to sharing information uh, both locally, but getting information as well. University partnerships have yielded infrastructure products like bendable concrete, sensors for roadways, bridges and locks, filters to remove PFAS, and accelerated ballast tests for ships in the Great Lakes. Community conversations help understand research needs, build new partnerships, and provide insight for decision-making today and tomorrow. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us here today. Um, it's my pleasure to be with, uh, with all of you. Um, and really for the next uh, 30 to 35 minutes, uh, we'll be engaging in a conversation. Um, I'll be here as a moderator, but um, certainly we hope that this will engender just conversation among all of you. Uh, so let's start with uh, real brief introductions. Uh, Peter Adrians is with us today. He's a professor at the University of Michigan on environmental engineering, finance, and entrepreneurship. Welcome. Uh, next to you is Carrie Dugan, a partner at Ridge Lane Limited and Ridge Lane Capital, the sustainability practice, and founder and principal at Sustainability LLC. Clever. Okay. And then um, next to Carrie is Carol Miller, who's a professor at Wayne State University, civil and environmental engineering, and director of Healthy Urban Waters. Hello, uh, Leo C. Kempel is Dean of the Michigan State University College of Engineering. And moving over to this side, uh, we have Dennis Sigru, uh, a professional engineer, and also Lieutenant Colonel in the US Army and a, a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan. Uh, Joseph or Joe Sawaski, who is President and CEO at Merit Network Inc. Welcome. Uh, Kirk Steidel. Uh, senior Vice President at Econolite Systems, and Eric Pardini, Senior Consultant at Public Sector Consultants. So welcome, all of you. Uh, as you may have heard uh, earlier, um, when we are speaking, we have some microphones around the table, and you may just want to bring that closer. Take it off. Good. Well, um, I think to start, uh, I'm very interested to get initial reactions uh, from uh, from each of you. Just wondering what your uh, initial thoughts, uh, reactions are uh, from the takeaways that Brittany just shared with us. So are there general uh, trends or themes that you're thinking of? In principle, there's a lot of 
infrastructure challenges across the state. And we know that the longer you take to work on them, the higher the cost is. But on the flip side, there's a lot of te technology coming out. And so it'll be very important to blend the, the adoption of new technologies to kind of bootstrap going forward to fixing our infrastructure with the importance, of course, of doing it in a thoughtful way. Sure. Um, in terms of some overriding themes, I thought collaboration was a, a theme that came out um, certainly at the tour stops that I attended, and it sounds like the others that uh, re related uh, here today. So collaboration, by that I mean uh, certainly among our universities, uh, which I think we're well on the way to having that, but also collaboration with uh, the governmental agencies as well as the private sector, um, having those groups involved uh, at the table. I know that for water infrastructure um, in Michigan, there have been a lot of advances due to the fact that our universities are working with the water utilities, whether that be GLWA here in the Detroit area or um, I know the University of Michigan is working very closely with the Ann Arbor Water Utility and, and so on. So I think those sorts of um, collaborations, getting our expertise actually out in the field, internships can help a lot with that also. So just a broader theme of collaboration I think is very important. Echoing that, oh, I'm loud. Um, echoing what I heard here, because I think sometimes the points that Britt was making about collaboration and engagement are throwaways. And um, my previous experience tells me that they're in fact not throwaways. I spent a good deal of time embedded in City Hall here in Detroit on behalf of President Obama and former President Biden, and Vice President Biden. And um, that taught me a lot about listening, which Britt mentioned, uh, providing capacity, b literally being the capacity uh, at a time when the city was really um, struggling to have the capacity needed to leapfrog its infrastructure, um, and then providing technical support and additional financial resources. And um, that was the biggest lesson I learned from that, and I think it's directly transferable, to, no matter if we're talking about energy, water, transportation, or the built environment. Um, so I would just echo what, what you just said about um, engagement um, and collaboration, which is indeed a contact sport. I'll take this mic. I think there is uh, something missing from the takeaways. And uh, I direct the Center on Infrastructure Finance at the University of Michigan, actually in the College of Engineering. And very often in the conversations, wh wherever you were in the state, I wonder how many public finance managers, partners in public-private partnerships, and others were available. Because the biggest, one of the biggest problems is the infrastructure finance gap, right? There's a lot of needs. There's not enough money. I mean, that's the bottom line. Most of the infrastructure that we have in the state the legacy infrastructure is financed using a financial instrument that is essentially over 200 years old. And that has been modified a little bit. I'm talking municipal bonds and a little bit of loans mixed into that, and that's where you get your infrastructure. As you think about infrastructure innovation, we have to think about financial innovation too. And in fact, when you sort of go around the country and you know play around the financial uh, uh, system a little bit, there is a lot of a conversation now around Industry 4.0 meets infrastructure. So basically, how do we start integrating smart infrastructure systems, the data plays in unlocking new kinds of money that here too were not involved in infrastructure finance? And this is efficient capital. This is where the insurance companies come in. This is where new debt securities come in. I don't want to throw all the terminology out there, but there is a lot of money that has never played in infrastructure. Pension funds nationwide, only 1% of pension funds are committing any dollars to infrastructure. And a lot of that is because of the way we design infrastructure. So infrastructure design and infrastructure financing are actually directly linked. So you sort of get what you can finance or you finance what you can get. You know, so, we have to, so the two of them are actually working in tandem. And I think that's a big part of the conversation. Maybe even a question, maybe too early here, but... Did yeah, whether that even, I mean, just to, to, to plant the seed then, whether that even came up at any of these stops in your tour, uh, uh, I mean, where the financing model sort of where financial issues came in. It, it actually came up with your colleague, uh, Jerry Lynch, at the Sterling Heights. 
Yes, you, he had a perfect slide dedicated to you, so. So, as, as I listened to uh, the presentation and the takeaways, the one thing that struck me, if you look at all of those in total, is there's a bunch of people working on one little piece of the solution, and they think that they've got their piece figured out, whether it's logical solution or any solution. The big takeaway is they've all got to be balanced, whether it was the engagement of the community, whether it was to look at the, the economics of what you're doing, you have to look at it in totality and, and pull all of those pieces together. Because you could have the best technological solution that nobody can pay for. And it's not ever going to get implemented. So it's got to all be looked at together. And the, uh, the, the financing and funding, and those are two different issues. Uh, you know, you can find all kinds of ways to creatively finance. You don't have enough money to pay for it at the beginning. It doesn't. All of that stuff has to be viewed together in the same lens and the same conversation. Because everybody wants something free. And it's not going to happen. <laughs> But really quickly, uh, one of the things I found uh, is a theme in these stops is that you can't do it alone, right? So, building on Carol's point about collaboration, this is a motivated group of students. They want to invest in their community. They don't look at these things as expenses. Look at them as investments in sustainability and viability of their communities. And uh, boy, they're motivated and uh, they've got a lot of skin in the game. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I take away here, the, the need for infrastructure is pretty well known and documented. We talk about it all the time. It's in the media, uh, everywhere. I think solutions, Dean Kempel mentioned, technology's there, solutions are there. Uh, it's decision and action that's kind of slower. And, and I think to Peter's point, the understanding of the value that infrastructure gives and being able to balance cost and value, not just for, um, the community, but for the, the, the greater stakeholders, those, those financial arms uh, th that we described, uh, there's a knowledge gap there, being able to connect those two uh, that might present an opportunity. Yeah, I also had an observation to add in building off of this collaboration. Um, I think the, the way that this has been brought out into communities, it shows that um, this is a really an opportunity to take advantage of those first movers and to get to a point of scalability through communication of success stories. And so how are we leveraging the, the partnerships that are built through tours like this to say, hey, I've got something that works in my community because each community is dealing with their own infrastructure problems across the state and you know the, com the water example from Western Michigan I think has a lot of implications as we're only discovering the early instances um, around PFAS contamination and so we're just sort of on the leading edge there. Thank you everybody. This will probably be very frustrating because we'll just want to dig into all of these um, with more time than we have. Um, but since we are in Detroit, and uh, Brittany set it up very nicely about the fact that this multi-stop tour is now here, and thinking about in this context, uh, these topics, these areas of infrastructure, um, you know, what are the implications for this city, this community, um, and the challenges that exist? Um, and Carrie, I'd like to draw on your experiences of working in the city on these issues. What are your thoughts on uh, priorities, uh, opportunities that exist um, in terms of addressing infrastructure ga gaps in Detroit? Great, well I guess I already said what I used to do, so that's not a secret. Um, I spent a lot of time, um, I came from the U.S. Department of Energy to Detroit on behalf of Secretary Moniz and then the pres former president, former vice president, um, to at the request of the city and through a program that we're running to take a look at infrastructure wide. So I worked on the LED streetlight conversion, the, the urban solar park at O'Shea Park, and I was just getting into mobility when we all got, um, we finished our job. So um, looking at Detroit today, um, for me the frame I have is about honestly site selection and competitiveness for this city and this region. So I don't take any of the individual infrastructure problems alone. They're, they're all connected. Energy, water, um, transportation systems, accessibility, they're all interrelated and, and the built environment. We have a lot of challenges. Finance is certainly one of them. There are regulatory and policy roadblocks to residential upgrades, for example, um, that we need to overcome. But for me, I look at it from a, a lens of you know climate impacts. This country faces billion dollar disasters every year. That's not going to stop. 
So how does Detroit position itself, indeed leapfrog into the state of the art using the great minds that we have in this room and at our universities? The strength of the URC is something that should not be taken lightly, but it's not sufficient. We need to bring in other regional partners, our national laboratories, for example. And then, frankly, this is an opportunity to create a virtuous cycle. I talk about competitiveness. You want your alumni to come back and live and work and play in uh, these communities. I did that. I chose to come back, but not everyone does. Um, so uh, I would just ask that, that this brain trust continue to grow, um, that this table that Brittany is, and the team has put together um, be steadfast and continue, because that's frankly how we did the work. When I was in service, we created a table, brought every relevant agency to the table over six and a half years. I'm very proud of the work we did, but it's uh, persistent, painful, and you have to bring new partners to the table. Sorry, I, I will give the mic back now. <laughs> Thank you. I like that virtuous cycle. Um, uh, it, possibly another perspective to add to this uh, would be you, Joe. Um, so Detroit has different, has barriers to access in ways that might be different than other parts of Michigan. Um, so can you tell us a little bit more about, or tell us about the Michigan Moonshot project that uh, Merit Network has been working on um, with other partners? Um, I understand that it was unveiled at the Mackinac Policy Conference uh, yep. recently. So uh, yeah, if you could tell us about the Moonshot Project and how it could help address some of the barriers in this city. Sure. Well, I'd like Thanks. to say it's great to be back at Wayne State, my old campus. Worked here for the better part of a decade and uh, still love the place. I have a lot of friends here too, so thanks for the kind invitation. Uh, yeah, we were uh, really lucky to host a panel at the Mackinac Policy Conference. Uh, it was all about uh, broadband, whether it was rural or urban, and the digital divide that exists both in uh, you know those areas, urban and rural. And uh, we were very honored to have Lieutenant Governor Garland Gilchrist as a panelist uh, on the panel. Uh, he didn't seem to mind that the name of our panel was Fix the Damn Internet for Students. Uh, he, he let us have that one, which was very kind to him, so that was uh, pretty cool. We also had the uh, CEO of Rocket Fiber, uh, uh, co-founder as well, Mark Hudson, was on the panel. And my friend and colleague, Dr. Johannes Bauer, who's in the audience, and I hope we have a chance to hear him speak in a moment, too, about this collaboration we have going. So uh, it was a great panel. It was widely viewed, a lot of social media activity. Um, and for those of you who don't know Merit, uh, Merit is one of the artifacts of research collaboration between the URC schools, maybe one of the oldest ones, and uh, most prevalent as well. So we are the nonprofit telecommunications organization that runs a 4,000-mile fiber optic network connecting all the public universities, supporting researchers and students and, and uh, staff uh, in, in their endeavors. Um, and uh, it's a very constructive uh, collaboration, so that theme of collaboration kind of comes back in here. Uh, because of the position I hold and because of Merritt's expansive network, we were uh, privileged to participate in uh, Governor Snyder's broadband uh, uh, task force. And uh, my eyes were really open through that work about the challenges that are seen both in urban and rural areas. Uh, that report actually unveiled that 27% of students in Michigan do not have access to what the FCC classifies as the most rudimentary broadband internet access. And uh, it's a tragedy. Uh, so. Merit has steeled itself to actually launch this program called the Michigan Moonshot, which I describe as a, a comprehensive solutions framework that uh, will help communities and citizens understand the extent of their problems to really, uh, importantly, measure broadband access in the state. And this is an issue that is, uh, if you're in this area, you hear a lot about it. In fact, our own uh, governor, or I'm sorry, Senator uh, uh, Gary Peters last week uh, is supporting legislation called the Broadband Data Act that is all about mapping broadband data better. And the reason I mention this is because there is money for broadband. The feds uh, release tens of billions of dollars to support broadband infrastructure build outs, yet they don't know where to go because the data uh, mapping process they have is so fatally flawed. This is a huge national conversation. So this is an area where there is money, they just don't know where and how to spend it best. So it's really interesting. Um, you asked me about the differences in uh, rural and urban areas, and, and I'd like uh, Dr. Bauer, you know, when he gets a moment to talk about the study they did called uh, uh, Broadband to the Neighborhood, uh, the Digital Divide in Detroit. And uh, the difference in Detroit is that it's really about affordability. So affordability is driving choice, uh, driving citizens to make choices between ISP services that are very robust to their homes or using their phone as a mobile network, mobile network device. 
And that's why the problem exists in Detroit. It's really about affordability. In the rural areas, it's really about infrastructure. It's expensive. It takes a long time to build, wired or wireless, and there's a lack of it. So, uh, but both those situations evidence themselves the same way. Uh, I have traveled all around the state, and I have seen families outside of libraries on cold, snowy nights in Michigan in their cars using free Wi-Fi at 7 o'clock so they can complete their homework. This is uh, something that should not stand. And in Detroit, you know, families are, you know, bringing their students to McDonald's to uh, complete their homework. And this is holding people back from their full potential. So that's why we've launched the program. Okay. Great, Brittany. <clears throat> So, Joe, can you just for everyone, and we can post it up on our website, can you tell where people can learn more about the Moonshot? Sure. If you go to uh, merit.edu, yes, we are a .edu. We actually uh, managed, I think, that domain for a, for a while nationally because we were so early on in uh, uh, the technology uh, ecosystem nationally. Uh, if you go to our website and search for Moonshot, or I think you can go to merit.edu slash Moonshot, and there's a lot of information about it. And I will say Merit is launching Michigan's first broadband uh, summit. Uh, in September, where we're trying to get communities and stakeholders and providers together to collaborate and share information. So I'll do a little plug there as well. Okay. Joe, you mentioned the uh, government funding, I think, that's for broadband. It's how are they making decisions right now on where to direct those funds and what data sources are they relying on? That's a great question, and that is actually the crux of the issue. So uh, a couple times a year, all telecommunication providers fill out this thing called the 477 form, the FCC 477 form. If you live in my world, you know all about this. And uh, telcos self-report whether they serve residents in these areas, and these are large areas, tens of square miles sometimes. And if they serve one resident or plan to serve one resident, they check a box and no federal funding can uh, come into these areas. Well, you full well know that if your neighbor on one street, uh, half a county over, has broadband, you may not have it because providers may not have built there. Yet this is the process that is driving our funding, and I'm so thankful Senator Peters is really pushing for better ways to map. Be I, if I can leave you with one thing, mapping equals money in the broadband world. So, Peter, do you want to... Give us yeah. one more thought about this. And we yeah, just on. one more thought about this. I don't know whether you're aware of what uh, San Francisco has done the last uh, year, year and a half, essentially taking back broadband from market players and bringing it into the public realm by bond financing it such that there is more broader access to, uh, to and that's in San Francisco, <laughs> uh, more broad access to, uh, to broadband uh, uh, even in the communities outside of the city. That's great. And just one thing, I don't want to go too deep on broadband because we have a lot of really important issues to discuss. Uh, Dr. Bauer at MSU has launched a very novel citizen science crowdsource-based broadband data measurement experiment. He launched it this year, uh, just in the last couple months, with 7,000 students in Michigan and rural areas. And in this way, we're trying to map from the citizen's perspective, not from the provider perspective. And I really want him to talk about this later when he gets a chance. So. Yeah, great. Uh, we are planning to uh, hear from Dr. Bauer after our panel. Great. Thank Thanks. you. Great. Um, so just moving on um, to one of our other infrastructure topics. Um, so smart infrastructure came up frequently, maybe at all of the tour stops. And um, uh, it was featured certainly in the URC's publication that uh, kicked off the tour as well. Um, last spring's report. So, for example, at Sanilac County and at the um, Sterling Heights tour stops, uh, there was conversation about technologies, sensors, bendable concrete, other other kinds of uh, advancements in the field that are being tested, that are being used in the state. Um, uh, and so, it'd be helpful uh, to I think for us and and for everyone here to get a bit of an overview or a rundown of what kind of sensor applications are being used. Um, so I'm going to turn to you, uh, Leo. Um, would you kind of give us a, a rundown of some of those sensor applications that are being used uh, for water infrastructure and transportation, at least to start with? And how much time do I have? <laughs> <laughs> a minute. Okay. So uh, first, let's 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 talk water. It's a fluid, of course, and you want to measure it as vo volumetrically as possible. So now there are sensors that can be deployed on ro robotic fish. So rather than getting point solutions every so far apart, you can continuously m monitor the, the 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 water and look for the molecules that that, that don't die and so forth. Um, in terms of bridges, we have uh, sensors that we can embed in the bridges and in roads that do not require power. They'll be there 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now. And they tell you a lot about stress and strain going on. And from that, 
you can infer the health state of, uh, of infrastructure. I think one, one of the most exciting uh, type of sensors being deployed to today in Michigan is really coming from the vehicles themselves. You know, the, tech, the technology that the Detroit 3 have been putting into cars to enable mobility, to enable a more comfortable ride and so forth, also are sensors. They weren't necessarily built that way, but they can be built that way when you've got the connectivity. So I'm driving my car, the um, uh, sem se semi-active suspension system, uh, I'm too cheap to buy that good of a car, but um, I, I'm, as, as I'm driving around in it, uh, that, that same device that makes the ride smoother is a sensor. It will tell you the road state. And now if we offload that data from the vehicle via a comm link to MDOT, now we can start putting a map together of what the current state of our roads are and just be a lot more proactive. And perhaps even in finance, you can start working new models of how to keep our, our infrastructure going because you, you've essentially have people deploying the sensors. Each one of us carries a sensor with us. I've even seen people with four. You have four cell phones on you, you've got four <laughs> sensors, right? And we can use that data to improve our, our, our infrastructure. And, and it's an incredibly inexpensive way for the state to do it because the consumer is bearing most of the cost of bringing that sensor around. And so this is really an exciting time. The Internet of Things makes it ubiquitous sensing possible. Yeah, I, I just, uh, just wanted to add um, another uh, concept that uh, I would love to see added to the uh, diagram that we had up there of the different infrastructure circles that were intersecting and so on, the Venn diagram there. Um, I'm not sure whether it would be overlaid or another circle, but, but the whole health um, and, uh, you know, infrastructure, we're talking about infrastructure health as well as many other aspects of infrastructure, but then human health and uh, environmental health and so on. So, so the sensors that we talk about, you know, we, th certainly there are many sensors out to um, help us with asset management, with infrastructure, and to determine the health of the infrastructure and so on. But obviously there's tons going on regarding um, wearable sensors for human health. And the relationship between our infrastructure and the health of citizens uh, in different places and so on, I think that's a very important connection that is obvious, but we all need to make, and I think it's also a connection that can help with some of the finance issues. Because in terms of going after financing, one thing that I found is that a lot of times people aren't too interested to hear about gray or green infrastructure, but when you start telling them about the impacts of poor infrastructure and the health impacts, that's when you start to get some real um, buy-in and some real understanding. Uh, so just uh, one point that I wanted to make regarding the health and keeping that in there. I'm just going to weigh in that I am excited about green and gray infrastructure. So, <laughs> <laughs> so just quickly going back to my earlier point on um, not just isolating a singular type of infrastructure. Um, as it relates to sensors, thinking about things like the LED street lights in Detroit, the sensors that could or may be attached to those to study things like air quality in some of our hardest impacted communities, as well as supporting an autonomous future. Um, these may require new um, partnerships, like I was saying before. Um, so I, I'm not ignoring, I'm not gonna get technical, that's your job. Um, but I, I do think that um, bringing more folks to the table to support these sort of P3 opportunities is important. Yeah, I wanted to amplify what uh, Carol said before, I guess, on the financial value. I mean, you think about it, sort of sensors, whatever sensors they are, whether they're in roads, in water systems, in energy systems, uh, in, in, in water systems or whatnot, they are, they make up, the, they make the difference between a cost of infrastructure and value of infrastructure. And Dennis brought that up earlier, too. So the whole value of infrastructure is really the, the informational efficiencies, I guess, that get unlocked from, from, from infrastructure by sensors. And that, that piece of the whole digital asset, the digitalization of infrastructure, is really where the attractiveness is, I guess, for new folks, I mean, be they P3s or others, to sort of come into infrastructure, because that makes it different from what infrastructure was 20 and 
or even 10 years ago. Thanks. Um, so during the tour stops, we learned that MDOT, the Department of Transportation, has really been playing a crucial role in helping to develop some of these technologies and testing them out in the field. And uh, Kirk, you had a um, previous role uh, leading that, that agency for many years um, and helping to move the agency toward um, that, that uh, uh, technology-focused um, approach. Could you talk a bit about that role that MDOT has played and is playing in testing and, and developing these kind of technologies? Sure. So first of all, you, could, you can appreciate the fact that uh, any public agency has huge pressures to just fix today, right? Right now, it's just fixed today. And I maintain for a long time, still do, will do forever, that if you just rebuild 1970, then you're stuck in 1970, right? right. And, and we're not doing any favors to our kids or grandkids if we rebuild 1970. So while we are rebuilding, we have to be looking forward. And part of looking forward is feeding the research so that we know where is the innovation, right? And then innovation comes out, you get lots of ideas. My test always was, is there a need for what somebody came up with? Uh, and I'll give you an example of, of one that clearly doesn't. Um, it's not one, that, this was one developed in a private sector. Um, in fact, I'll just tell you now, it was a, um, a, a big OEM that developed technology so that the car could lift up a tire as it drove over a pothole. I saw that and said, why don't we just pay to fill the pothole <laughs> instead of put a $20,000 computer system on a car and have it jump around the road. That's, so is there a need, right? Number two is, is it scalable, right? Because I have seen lots and lots of ideas, but they're not scalable, right? They're, they're just, they're way too expensive to, and, and they can't be commercialized. And the third one is, is it commercialized? Because you can't just do one-offs and, and expect to do it over 100,000 miles of roadways, which is what we have in the state of Michigan or 10,000 bridges, just not going to work. So. That's just the fundamentals of rebuilding. So we pushed really hard to make sure that we put money in to research, whether it's materials researchers or process research, or the latest in the last 10 years was this technology around mobility, connected automated vehicles, um, really working with the, the, the big auto companies that are here, suppliers, the rest, and say, what is it you need? What do you need infrastructure to do? And we ran parallel for a long time with autonomous and connected, and they, they go back and forth. But at the end of the day, it really is about tying systems together. Now, my new job, that's why I actually went to a technology company that's in infrastructure, and it revolves around traffic signals, because there is a lot of, of technology at every single intersection. There are, there are a lot more sensors than most people even have a, have a notion of. And, and if you look at it from the energy perspective, it's about how do, you keep, how do you keep that flow moving? So you eliminate the congestion, you eliminate the bottlenecks, and you keep traffic moving wherever it's intended to go without stopping. So you increase that, that fuel efficiency. Uh, and frankly, at the end of the day, it's about safety uh, and, and it's about saving lives, right? So all of the pieces we've talked about, if you come back to the community, it's about safety. It's about safety for all those different pieces. You know, on a roadway perspective, last year in the U.S., we killed 37,360 people. Well, in what realm is that ever acceptable? It's not. I mean, so, so there's got to be a, a component in there of safety as well. So from a public agency perspective, I advocate that you have to be looking forward. You have to dedicate, you know, half a percent, one percent of your budget into some kind of research that, that says, how are we doing it better? Thank you. Um, so moving more into the watery realm, um, at the Sioux Locks tour stop, um, uh, we learned uh, about the, um, uh, some of the technologies, the innovations that are happening there to help keep the maritime trade and the navigation in the Sioux Locks um, working. Um, so Dennis, I'm wondering, given your experience there, if you could uh, help us with better understanding um, you know, what is, what is the perspective uh, from uh, navigation, um, from maritime trade, um, we're using these technologies and, and, you know, what are some things that we should be thinking about? So I'll give a couple different perspectives on that. Uh, <laughs> from the Corps' perspective, we had a challenge maybe, maybe five, ten years ago where we discovered some of the steel and the anchorages. These are the things that hold up the gates to the lock. Uh, 
and it had some structural issues to it. That, that's addressed now, uh, but at the time it was assessed that there was a 7% chance of failure you know, at any given year. That is not within the margin of operation uh, for, for us. Um, what strikes me though is we didn't know about it for a number of years. Right? We had a pre-existing condition that I think some of the sensors we've already described and doing it smarter as we go to build new infrastructure up there, can we apply some of the new technologies that we have so we're not surprised by it again in 30 years? Let's do it smarter. From another perspective, I have heard from uh, ship captains and the shipping industry the challenges of coming into the locks. It, it may not be obvious, and I don't know if anyone's been up there and, and seen a ship go off course and strike a wall or uh, strike another ship. It doesn't happen every day, but it happens periodically. And the reason is there are some really tricky currents and hydraulics uh, flowing through there. Uh, can we employ some sensors that provide real-time feedback to the captains that allow them to make that adjustment approaching the lock? I think that technology exists. It sounds uh, very reasonable. Closer to home, closer here in Detroit, we have uh, ice dam conditions that pop up periodically, especially along Lake St. Clair, uh, where, where we get the ice floating down, creating a dam, and flooding coastal communities. And we have come up with techniques to sense the difference in the lake levels uh, in Lake Huron and then downstream in Lake St. Clair. Uh, and, and where we see a, a disparity, you see an anomaly, you're able to get the Coast Guard out there to, to clear it out. It reduces it a little bit. Um, but I, I think, again, there's probably an opportunity in areas like that to, to do better, do more real time. Uh, last year was, was one of particular challenge. Um, so, so those are three that jumped to mind. Uh, another, and I'm unsure what, what the problem that needs solving here is, but those ships have sensors on them right now. So access to the data, again, that we've described already. How are we using the information that's already out there to make smarter decisions? Maybe we're making uh, fewer delays at the port. Maybe we're making uh, um, a more refined schedule of ships coming through the locks or through the other connecting channels, the Detroit River and such. Um. Moving, moving along, um, I think I'm going to turn this back over to, uh, or move uh, back into our conversation that we started about finances um, and and trying to come up with creative funding solutions. Um, as was stated earlier, um, none of this is free. It's all going to cost something. Um, so whether it's constructing the infrastructure or maintaining it, um, but of course we know that our local communities in Michigan also are very cash strapped. Um, and how are they going to pay the costs? Um, for, for maintenance of infrastructure they have, let alone trying to upgrade uh, or expand. Um, so clearly we need some more creative financing options. Um, so maybe, Peter, uh, can I turn this back over to you if you want to uh, continue thinking or sharing with us um, uh, some, and others as well, uh, about smart infrastructure financing, you know, clean tech development. These are things that you've been working on for several years. Um, so would you kind of pick this conversation up again about um, how we can creatively finance some of these infrastructure needs in the state? Actually, let me start out with a, a question that's also for the entire audience. Anybody know what the first major piece of infrastructure built in the United States with crowdfunding is? First crowdfunded major piece of infrastructure. Ev all of you know it. North, uh, North Pennsylvania water system. Okay, I'm going to ignore that one. The 79. <laughs> Another one. It's everybody knows this one, and probably most of you have driven across it. The Golden Gate Bridge. So the Golden Gate Bridge in California was actually financed by citizens in a crowdfunding model in 1930. Since then, of course, I mean, operations and maintenance require new types of financing models and P3s and, you know, I mean, now you pay your fees to get across the bridge and all of that. But we can never say to your point earlier that when you have impassioned and empowered citizens, they can build a nice piece of infrastructure. It's possible. So coming to uh, uh, the, the 2000s and uh, I mean the, uh, this day and age, 
When I talk to communities, one of the things I say, you guys got to learn how to play the money ball game. Anybody here seen money ball? If you haven't, see money ball. <laughs> Oakland A's, right? <laughs> um, so the whole idea behind that is, and, and it, it, it makes it, it's very salient to the conversation of smart infrastructure and how you finance this. So how do you build a world-class baseball team on a fraction of the dollars that you got available? They essentially were a poor baseball team, right? That no capital, that couldn't afford a $300 million players, right? That 15 million. And what are you gonna get for 15 million? Well, they looked at all the data of all the different players. How did they throw? How efficient they had to do? Their underhand to throw, over, I mean, all sorts of things. Right? So look at the data and basically said, I think, you know, even though he's an odd duck, I mean, on the game, he actually completes, you know, and actually allows us to, uh, to have home runs and whatnot. We're gonna buy, he's undervalued by the market, but we're gonna pay him 15 million and we got a world-class team. Of course, it only lasted for two years. We want our infrastructure to last for longer than two years, right? So now go to DC Water. Right, so DC Water, a public water authority, I mean, is the first experiment with a new financing model, right? A variable interest rate bond, or call it an, uh, an impact bond. I mean, there's all sorts of language around that, right? Which is essentially a new, the, f the first model by a public agency to actually incorporate operational data and inform the financials. So here's, here was the choice. Either we're gonna put a $2 billion pipe in the ground, to convey our water and our overflows, or we're gonna build green infrastructure above ground for 350 million, 2 billion, 350 million. To a community, to an agency, big difference, right? So, of course, the, the, the green infrastructure or smart infrastructure is a new thing, and anything that is a new thing carries risk, right? So, in order to finance 350 million instead of a pipe, which we've been financing for hundreds of years, Right, so they needed to actually then provide uh, the, the investors with an incentive. So here was the incentive. The argument was, DC Water said, if you're gonna build a, a 350 million green infrastructure above ground that can divert all the water and actually take, move water away from our old gray infrastructure below ground, it reduces our O&M costs, and we're gonna actually share out of these operations and maintenance costs to the investor that if this infrastructure uh, performs uh, better than expected, instead of a triple A, 345% yield, you actually get six and a third yield. So it was a win-win for the agency, for the community, because they had to take on less debt, and for the investor. So this whole money ball game is really about all the communities that we have, including the poor communities. They sit on data. They don't, def it's not about glitzy sensors, it's not about, you know, you know having Google-type buildings and whatnot, that's not it. I mean, you got reports, right? You got operational performance, you got infor uh, information on pipe breaks, you got, inform you got information on how well the community likes the service that's being provided by the agencies. That is all data. And that data actually helps, of course, now we need to start thinking about new job creation, right? Because effectively all the infrastructure, smart infrastructure, is a tech play. It is no longer the way people used to maintain and manage and operate infrastructure. You need to become more tech, tech savvy. So there needs to be, you know, data scientists at the county level or at the state level to start looking at that kind of data. And here's the reason why we need to start doing it. I'm gonna get to your poor communities too. One of the reasons we need to start doing it. So I'm working with Nuveen. Nuveen is an investment arm of TIAA, right? Which we know as, as educators, most of us know that quite well. So Nuveen is the third largest holder of muni bonds, municipal bonds in the United States, third largest. They're starting on an initiative to reprice and revalue all muni bonds in the entire United States by integrating operational data and just other intangible information data on every piece of infrastructure that was ever financed in the US, so basically, so now here's the value to communities, right? So if you even have some information, it doesn't have to be the glitziest sensor that uh, Leo can come up with, right? <laughs> it could be whatever information, <laughs> whatever information, I guess, that is available in a piece of infrastructure, if you integrate that in, you know, our water system, our energy system, our road system does this, that piece of information is now starting to get used by investors they reprice and revalue, so you get preferential rating on a bond or on debt. 
preferential rating on bond or debt means reduced interest rate, means lower cost of capital to the community, right? So it is, it's a whole trickle-down effect from information to cost of capital. And which public finance manager does not want to have low cost of capital and infrastructure? I mean, find me, find me any of them. <laughs> so, I, so now, regarding the, the poorer communities, and we have a lot of conversation around that, because once you have a smart infrastructure system, the whole, I would say, financial model kind of changes. I mean, think about a bond, a traditional bond, you issue a bond, say, on a road, on a water system or whatnot. Right, it goes back to either revenue that you have to collect from the community or it is priced based on the credit rating from the community. So again, Amtramic different from Ann Arbor, right? So, or Flint or whatnot. So one is gonna pay more for debt than the other one. So in that sense, the current financing systems actually bias against poor communities because of that. Smart infrastructure finance, what it does is because it creates that data pool, that information pool, that gets actually transacted and valued in business to business markets. So now, so you're sort of almost shifting the, the, the agency, I guess, or the business to community uh, um, line to a business to business line. So even then a poor community can still capture some of the cash flows that come out of the business to business transactions. But th this is a whole shift of thinking, I guess, around how we think about infrastructure systems. That hey, if the big investors are starting to think about pricing muni bonds that way, we better, it's already happening. This is not a new thing. It's, it's been happening and we have to sort of get a, ahead of that eight ball. Uh, and I think there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of educational opportunities as well, which is why we're launching a new master in smart infrastructure finance at the University of Michigan in the College of Engineering. So all the design engineers and everybody else can take it and, and learn about these new financing models. Thank you. That was my, my little plug for today. <laughs> Thanks, Peter. Um, uh, do we have any more, a couple quick points on that topic? So just to pile on a little bit here. Da data has value. And the data will be present in the communities, it'll be present in the NDOT and so forth. And so I would, I, I would look at ways to get the American private sector involved in building out our infrastructure with access to data. But as part of that, when we make foreign mil mil military sales, typically, sir, there's a provision in there for us to source some of the materials in the host country. And that's part of the, the deal. Well, we could have a deal where to get access to the data that MDOT has and so forth for a fee, right? They also have to provide infrastructure dollars to expand out into the poor com com communities because data has value. And that value will only go up o o over time. So I think that's part of the, the creative solutions. And that's a role that the private sector and government and, and uh, the, 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 the universities can, can play in. Yeah, just One more. If I can quickly, I, I, I think that's where the knowledge gap is, though, because we don't understand that value. And therefore, it's difficult to identify those win, win, win opportunities that Peter described. They're there. But we've got to leverage the data in order to understand the value. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, just quickly to, to Dean, Dean's uh, point. Uh, so the company that I work for has one third of North America's traffic signals. We have data on 100,000 intersections. Um, we can't get all of it because some of the technology is old, but we're in the process of getting that. What we've struggled with is, okay, well, now what value does that have, right? How do you monetize that? So that's one of the things that we're, I'm, I'm really interested in your uh, uh, smart infrastructure finance piece because it's that's the conversation people have now. How do you monetize what we have? We've got, we sit on a whole bunch, but mm -hmm. who's it a value, you know, who wants it and who wants to pay for it to help build the rest of it? I don't want to hawk time here, but just to answer that particular question, there's sort of mainly three buckets that people look at in terms of data. And the, the first bucket is the one that we've always been looking at as an infrastructure is how do the data inform or improve our operations and maintenance. That's the first sort of bucket of data. The second bucket of data is the equity value. So basically how does the data inform, you know, the, the, the equity appreciation, I guess, if you will, of infrastructure within a community. And that, that includes a lot of intangible data. That is anything from carbon reduction, to happiness of the community, to, I mean, all these other factors and whatnot. And then the third piece, that's, and that's equity, and equity is not transacted. So equity is just appreciated in a, in a market kind of valuation uh, context. 
The third one is derivative data, and that's the one that you're talking about. That's where the data auctions come in and all these other contracts and whatnot. So, so everybody, I mean, not everybody, but the, the, the financiers started to look at these kind of these three buckets associated with infrastructure. But there was another piece that both of you brought up with regards to data, and that is, you know, the whole privacy issue, right? Privacy and cybersecurity issue. And so there's a lot of conversation in many communities from cities to smaller communities, and that is how do we start thinking about another, another word here, data ontologies. How do you bucket different kinds of data with respect to privacy considerations and cybersecurity considerations? So the, 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 the British are starting to talk about a data commissioner, an elected data commissioner that becomes part of, of, of cities and, and larger communities. This is fascinating, and it'd be great to just be able to talk about each one of these for, for an hour or two. Um, we want to be opening this up to uh, general Q&A uh, with the group here. Um, and uh, I think we have a, a couple of uh, people here um, with us today uh, who we'd like to call out in particular. Uh, and one of those people is, um, let's turn around here. Uh, from Michigan State University, he was mentioned earlier, um, but he is director of the Quello Center uh, at MSU, Dr. Johann Bauer. Um, and you had a nice uh, introduction earlier, so I'm not going to repeat it, but if uh, you could share with us uh, a little bit more about the work that you've been doing on the Moonshot and yeah. other work. Yes, uh, my pleasure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me say maybe a sentence on the center that I'm currently directing. It's called the Coelho Center for Media and Information Policy, which gives you the scope of the work we're doing. Jim Coelho used to be a, a commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission. He was from Detroit. He served for almost a quarter century at that commission, was a very impassioned uh, public interest advocate, and he always w was working for on those sort of a... Uh, um, bipartisan solutions that would really advance the public interest. So the center tries to do th theoretically rigorous work that is practically actionable. And sometimes, you know, it's difficult to reconcile those two, but that's our goal. And I'd like to sort of briefly mention, because this was, uh, was uh, alluded to, uh, two pieces of work that we did. One was in the city of Detroit. Now, that study uh, has been read like a Rorschach test by many people, right? I mean, you, you, it's a nuanced, uh, nuanced piece of work, and, and you, you emphasize different aspects of it. Uh, essentially, what we found are three things. This was actually done by my predecessors before I became the director of the institute. One was that uh, indeed connectivity is not the primary issue probably in many Detroit neighborhoods, although I should say this study was limited only to three of those. Uh, Cody Rouge, uh, I think this neighborhood, uh, seven, eight mile Woodward, and then I think uh, Milwaukee Junction were the three neighborhoods. Uh, but in those, its representative was, was done in uh, a co collaboration with Wayne State University, a survey of people plus focus groups. Um, how, however, households are underconnected. That there's no way not to see this, right? But they're very creative. Like the bra strapped model also is very, very widespread. But right? they find ingenious ways to find connectivity, but it's through the neighbors piggybacking on, on, on others, going to coffee houses and so forth. Not the best way to really take advantage of these technologies. The second uh, thing we found is that, that th the myth that broadband is used for entertainment purposes is completely wrong. Entertainment was, was the number eight or number nine uh, type of uses, among others. It was job seeking, information seeking, health access to healthcare information, and so forth. And then lastly, we did find uh, evidence that, that there was indeed an affordability issue. Right? And, and the cost of, of getting broadband uh, in the city of Detroit is actually comparable to mid-income uh, countries, globally speaking, and that's relatively high, right? And so something has to be done on that regard. Uh, and then the second one, uh, sorry that I'd like to mention briefly, because I think it, it contributes to this discussion, is, is the one that Joe already alluded to. It's that uh, related to the Moonshot project, and, and that our broadband data is inaccurate has been known since the NTIA created the first map about 10 years ago. Right? And it's, it's a statistical attribution rule that they used for simplicity that led to an overcounting uh, of connectivity. And so there's many, many efforts around the United States currently to improve the data, the quality of the data. But there's one big flaw of this data. All we do it by, by looking at speed measurements, for example, is we look at those who are connected. We have no clue what happens to those who are not connected, right? So we figured we can, of course we would like to know 
how big the quality, or good the quality of connectivity is for those who are connected, and that's what the, the crowdsourcing technology-driven model that we built, a platform to measure uh, internet speed and internet quality, uh, pr primarily initially with our, our, our K-12 uh, students uh, on, on a pilot basis, together with Merit Networks. But we also uh, built a second parallel study that looks at uh, a survey-based study in classrooms with the same schools, and we found very, very uh, ingenious ways, we, we think, to, to be able to connect those two data sets without violating any privacy issues. They're completely identified data. We use like a data trustee model that eventually will allow us to link the, the survey data with the accessibility data. And for the first time, we'll actually be able to tell what the consequences are of, of, of poor quality connectivity or no connectivity at all. And when we talk about infrastructure, Part of the cost is, is actually what kind of infrastructure do we envision, right? And we cannot answer that question realistically unless we know more specifically what the benefits or the harms of not having access to infrastructure is. And, and we think that our work uh, will enable us to answer those questions um, in a more robust and more meaningful way so that we can find least cost solutions to really fix the problem going forward. So in a nutshell. Maybe more than Thank a nutshell, you. but that's, that's what we do. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, also, I'd like to introduce uh, Wayne State University's Vice President of Research. Dr. Stephen Lanier is here. Uh, thanks for joining us. And uh Thank you, Elizabeth. And um, uh, I just also echo, echo President Wilson's uh, welcome for everybody here. As I look around this room, it's so nice to see all these bright people gathered at the table but also our representatives from uh, Senator Peters, Senator Stabenow's office, state representatives, uh, private companies, different types of partners, because if we're going to do anything in this space, it takes all of these people participating together. I'd like to comment on a couple of things. Um, I've been here about five years now, and one of the things that struck me around about the URC and really culminated with this tour and this conversation today. I can't think of anywhere else in the country where you see this type of conversation of uh, engaged people from the university, community, tackling broad issues of substance to the entire state. I mean, you just don't see that. I was trying to think about that. And I, uh, I think it's a big deal. And as I think about that, and we've had some conversations uh, on the URC. I meet with, of course, Britt and my peers at Michigan State and University of Michigan on a regular basis. Uh, but some of the things that we're doing here, I think, would have relevance on a national scale. Because not just, you know, we're, Michigan's not alone in addressing these challenges. But I think we stand out in the teams that we, the people we've assembled and the way we're approaching it. And so I would think that some of these things that uh, we're talking about here in terms of infrastructure would have uh, relevance uh, across the country. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we, we seeded some funding around water infrastructure uh, that involved uh, Peter and Carol and Joan from Michigan State University, um, and really seeded that with the goal of providing a uh, a platform for addressing infrastructure on a national scale. But you can even build, it's not really national, it's global. So many of the things that we're learning here is a local, global interchange of information and how you can integrate that. So I think this body is really well positioned to do that. Not only do you have people from the, the universities and, the, and um, uh, government organizations, but foundations like the Herb Family Foundation, which also plays an important role. Uh, and then the, th the third item I wanted to make, the third point I wanted to make is that as I thought, I've looked at this, we have, and we t the panel touched a little bit about this, but maybe it's worth talking a little bit more. We, we, we're, we're talking about these infrastructure elements in different buckets. We have over here roads, we have over here broadband, we have over here infrastructure, we have here water. But in reality, what we really need is a healthy community. And what we're missing, I think, is sort of, what about social infrastructure? Social may not be the right word, 
but this umbrella of a healthy community that integrate, how you, wh what do we have to do to integrate all of these different buckets of infrastructure to generate a healthy community? Where people feel empowered and liberated to do everything that they can do. Nowhere is probably that more evident uh, than here in the city of Detroit, where all of these different infrastructure buckets come together. And then that challenge, I think, is also further amplified by many years of accumulated allostatic load, stress on the system, the built environment that plays out in different ways. So I think as we go forward, it would be interesting to kind of think about how Britt and all our colleagues here can further nurture this model so it has national impact. And then two, how we can think about anchoring or integrating these different buckets of infrastructure around uh, community empowerment. So is that, that's sort of the things that bubbled up in my mind. What a great way to wrap us up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I believe that there is uh, time for uh, question and answer from the uh, folks in the, in the rolly chairs. Um, we've got a couple of uh, microphones set up, that one there, one on the other side of the room. So um, if you do want to ask a question, please make sure you uh, state your name uh, and the organization or agency that you're representing. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Chip Amo. I am uh, the Director of Sustainability for Henry Ford Health System, um, just down the road here, so glad you all are here for this. Um, I just kind of wanted to echo uh, the last speaker in, and pose the question as well. Um, in one of the takeaways, we talked about jobs, 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 and I know there's always a focus when looking at infrastructure on the immediate jobs of building the infrastructure and um, oftentimes the public conversation around, is around building the infrastructure and the jobs that are created from that. Um, but how do we do a better job of quantifying the jobs of cr what good infrastructure creates mm -hmm. in terms of attracting um, businesses to the region, to the state? We're well known for our um, environment and protecting and wanting to protect that. So how does having good infrastructure with things like they were doing in Washington, D.C., with building, you know, green infrastructure for, to support stormwater versus investing in that. How do we quantify that? And then how do we also, as we're doing the equation, because I struggle this right now with our own uh, building our sustainability program at Henry Ford, how do we value, put value on the impact on people, on the, in, in our case, it's employee engagement, but how do we value the citizen engagement and the fact that they're, happier, uh, as you mentioned before, the social benefits of the infrastructure as well. I'll jump in because I'm not shy. On the <laughs> jobs front, um, I'll just point to it. We're sitting uh, surrounded by academics, so I mean, I leave it to you to do the rigorous study to tell what's going to happen in the region. But at the national scale, um, at least from the energy department, we did a quadrennial energy review that did produce what would happen if we invested fully in our energy infrastructure for transmission and distribution. It was something to do, like 1.5 uh, million jobs would be the end result. But I leave that to the smarter folks in the room. But to your other point on um, sort of equity inclusion and engagement of employees, I'm so glad you brought that up. Because um, as I sit in this room, there is a, a well-known saying here. I think um, in Detroit, Maurice Cox, who's a city planner, often will say, if it's not with us, it's not about us. And so as we, th as we think about engagement in Detroit, please keep that in mind. This is a very white room, and we're not in a very white city. Um, so I'm pivoting now to talk about one of the things I did support when I was in service called the Smart Cities Challenge. The city of Detroit did apply for it. It was a Department of Transportation opportunity, predated the uh, Amazon HQ2 <laughs> opportunity. Um, similar bruises, however. Um, Smart Cities Challenge. I thought, it, at least for this conversation, was important to bring up. It was a $50 million opportunity that one city would get. And of course, um, as it, much as it pains me, Columbus, Ohio got <laughs> that money. Um, but what they, the reason they received that big pile of cash was because they, the question was, if we give you a bag of money, how will you use it uh, to affect, how will you use mobility to affect change in society? And Columbus answered the question and said, we have an insane uh, infant mortality problem. We're going to solve that through mobility dollars. 
we're like, that's a really good use of money. Here you go. The most interesting part about that investment is it brought about $500 million off the sidelines from private sector investment. So to your point about figuring out this uh, investment, the leverage there is huge. Um, and the outcomes for, you know, kids and moms is pretty important too. So off the soapbox now. To specifically try to get to your question, how do we measure it? Uh, I mean, there are, we're trying to standardize some of these, these intangible, I guess, values, I guess, if you will. The, the ESG space, environmental, social, and governance space, which I'm sure you're very familiar with, is trying to standardize this now through uh, um, the, uh, oh, I forgot what the, the foundation is in San Francisco now. Sta the Sustainable Accounting uh, Development Board. Um, so they're trying to standardize how you actually ask that question, how do you find out that information. The other one that uh, many investors are starting, so corporations are using that, the way investors are starting to look at the SDGs, so the Sustainable Development Goals that are more broadly defined by the UN, and that of course reaches across, I mean, rich and poor, uh, and, and there's probably some information we can get out of that, so v with very specific questions, very specific weights and quantifiers affiliated with that. So that might be something to, to take a look at, and I don't think that's ever been permeated inside a community uh, to, to do that? Uh, that's a very good question, figuring out how to do that. So I'm an, an engineer, so I deal in data and, and results. And so we have to be in this for the long haul. Short-term measures won't tell us where you're going. You have to look long-term. The competitive advantage for Michigan is the quality of life here. We all use it. When we recruit people to the universities, when we rec recruit people to companies, we use the quality of life as the reason someone wants to move their family here. And so long term, we have to keep playing on that. We've got to keep showing that, that the infrastructure improvement in Michigan leads to a quality of life that makes a competitive advantage for Michigan, particularly over the West Coast and East Coast, because that's who the competitors are in a technology environment. And there's no reason that Michigan cannot lead in tech technology. We've got all the pieces and parts, but we have to show that the quality of life here is so much better, and I think it's a com compelling case. We have, um, if there is one more question, a, a brief one, um, we can take it. Well, it's not the question, okay. Mike, it's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> <That's> the <problem. laughs> questions are all brief. <laughs> My name is John Norton. I'm the Director of Energy Research and Innovation for the Great Lakes Water Authority. Mm. Peter was on my doctoral committee, so if I sound belaborous, <laughs> <laughs> there's the reason. You just won Jeopardy. You yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jerry Lynch was also on my doctoral committee as well. I, there's something, when I've been at about a half a dozen of these. We're funding about one and a half million dollars worth of research a year. Very applied, very applied, very applied. And then a few actual fundamental pieces with Wayne State regarding PFAS. But here's something I want to talk about. When I wander about, our facilities. So earlier today I was at the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world. And that's kind of cool, actually. You can, I brag about that. I got married last week and we toured the one on Mackinac Island. Because that's what you do with your wife. <laughs> um, but the, the, and a lot of the universities, when they have these meetings, there's infrastructure and there's innovation, and those are cool. I'm an engineer too, you know. But here's what a fundamental need is. And it's a fundamental need is something that the people that finance this stuff can deal with, and it's not more research. I have a PhD, I've written papers, I'm telling you that's not what we need. When I go around the water treatment plants and our wastewater treatment plant, we need the vocations, we need the trades. And so we're right now, I'm working with our department, our, it, it, we call it OD, Organizational Development, it's our HR group, to help figure out how we can train our employees better. That's where some of my research money is going to be going next year. And it just was a sudden smack in the face to realize after going into the schools, the high schools, which I do quite a lot with my wife now, who's a professor at Illinois, um, these kids aren't getting shop or electronics. And, well, what do we need to keep Waterworks Park running and the Rouge River Wastewater Treatment Plant running and all that? We need water treatment operators, but we need a hell of a lot of people with hands-on skills in electronics, plumbing. I'm a director. Our head, our, our top master electricians and our top 
master plumbers earn more than I do. They're putting a lot of overtime keeping those water plants going when they have trip breaks and whatnot. They're earning good six-figure coin. Let's go around Detroit and see how many people would find that interesting. Hey, I talk to people. Are you going to college? Are you in college? You you thinking of going back? Well, how do I tell them? How do I give this to them? Hey, are you in the trades? So a guy served me lunch a couple of days ago, and I said, Hey, are, you know, you thought of going to college? Oh, I got there. Degree in economics. He's serving me salad. I'm trying to get some relevance there. We need the trades. We need the hands-on skills. And that, when I go around and say, What research do you need? What do you got going there? There's things we're doing. Trust me, to make sure Flint never happens again. And by the way, our water that we're delivering is awesome. But the, we need the number one thing that they tell me is they need trained, skilled trades. There you go. It's not a question. <laughs> okay. So with that, we are going to wrap it up. Again, thank you everyone for making time today to be part of this. We have about five minutes left. Plus, I think we have the room for a little while after this if you want to stick around and and meet with one another and chat. That's another lesson learned from the dialogues is people really like to stick around and chat. So um, please feel free to do so. Thank you again. And thanks to our panelists.